Hearing to order. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Eileen Duff. I will be um, acting as the chair today since this counselor is a, a vacant seat. So first, I will read the letter from the governor. Uh, dear counselors, I'm pleased to nominate Edward W. Krippendorf Jr. to the position of Associate Justice of the District Court. I submit this nomination for the advice and consent of the Executive Council pursuant to Part 2, Chapter 2 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'm enclosing the nominee's resume for your convenience. Um, I will start by introducing the counselors who are here. Some may be running late and may join us. Councilor Errol Kudemaney, Councilor Tara Jacobs, Councilor Paul DiPaolo, and Councilor Terry Kennedy. Um, we will start this with uh, folks you have here to testify on your behalf. First witness. Judge uh, Tracy Lyons. All right. Welcome, Judge Lyons. Good morning. Good morning to you. Chief Justice Lyons. Chief Justice. Chief. Still getting used to that. It's all right. We like it. My fifth month. And uh, well, thank you for your service. Well, thank you. It uh, it really is a pleasure to be here and see some old faces and some to meet some new faces. I have known uh, Attorney Krippendorf for 24 years. He was the lead investigator in the sexual assault unit of the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, where I was chief of that specialized unit. He handled extremely sensitive cases in a respectful way with victims who were experiencing the worst trauma imaginable. Attorney Krippendorf was diligent in the way he conducted these investigations and worked with a multidisciplinary approach with the victims, witnesses, families, and the police departments at every stage of the case. During that time, he also went to law school and became 303 certified and actually was the second chair with me on a Superior Court rape case. Even as a student, it's evident he was going to be a talented attorney. After graduating from law school, he became an assistant district attorney in Suffolk County for eight years and represented clients before me, actually the Commonwealth before me. And for the past 11 years as a defense attorney, he often represented defendants who suffered from substance abuse disorders and mental health conditions. Very recently, I presided in the mental health court, actually for the past 14 years. Attorney Krippendorf, had a young man who was in my session for two years. He referred that young man to our session. I observed directly how he interacted with the family, his client, the probation department, the mental health forensic caseworkers, and the Commonwealth. And he was able to get that young man back on track and he successfully graduated from the mental health court session. Attorney Krippendorf, he conducts himself with the utmost professionalism at all times. Simply put, he cares. He is a well-rounded candidate, knowledgeable, reliable, and forthright. He treats everyone equally and respectfully, including clerks, staff, probation officers, court officers, and opposing counsel. He has an exceptional courtroom demeanor, prepared, punctual, measured, sound judgment. He is respected by all the judges at the BMC. We are all thrilled and excited for him and the trial court and this well-deserved opportunity to serve the public. The attributes that stand out to me when describing Attorney Krippentorf are fair, solid, steady, compassionate, and hardworking, with a deep understanding of how the community courts of the Commonwealth are the neighborhood courts focusing on and addressing local problems and offering alternative solutions. If you vote favorably on his behalf, the district court will acquire a wonderful judge who will deliver justice with fairness and dignity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Councilor Devaney. Nice to see you. How many you years? Too? 17. So, and I'm not just saying this. You look the same. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> no, that was uh, my pleasure. And now you're Chief Justice. Yes. Oh, wow. Am I part of that now? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes, you are. Yeah. Um, well, it's um, it, it's really uh, an honor that this nominee has you to come. And uh, I'd like to ask you, you mentioned about um, seeing him in, in many cases. 
Can you think of one that you that stands out in your mind about substance abuse or, or a disability and, and how he presided? Mm -hmm. Yes. In fact, it was last year when I was still sitting in the uh, mental health court session in the central division of the Boston Municipal Court. And as I stated, he referred his client to our session. It's a specialized unit. We were the first in the uh, in the state. 2007, uh, we began the mental health court session in the in the Boston Municipal Court. And believe it or not, we still have the same probation officer that started this program in 2007 and has continued to this day. So as I stated last year, Attorney Krippendorf came before me with this young man. He um, suffered from mental health uh, issues and substance abuse. And during that two year period, he was hospitalized, but would come back into our session. And Attorney Krippendorf, as I said, works really well collaborative, collaboratively with everyone and uh, managed to get his client working with his family. His father came to court every session, um, the client's father, and we got him back on track and he successfully graduated the mental health court session. It took two years, but I had a firsthand view to see how he handled his case, uh, his client, the family, and how we worked with the team to get that person back on track. You don't know how much it means to me to have you here and, and knowing you and uh, that that you are, you know, speak on his behalf. But how many years have you been observing him now, you would just say? 24. Imagine that. We don't get that. And I've said it before, and they're probably sick of me hearing it. We've had people sit in that chair, and I said, well, how many times you, have you observed this nominee in court? Oh, one time. That's not enough for us, and, and you're the real deal. And I, I really appreciate your um, testimony and for your coming here today. And you look great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other counselors? Uh, Mr. Jacobs? Thank you. I very much appreciate what you shared and how specific it was. And I was just hoping you might elaborate on the hard work element of your observations and experience. Would you like me to start when he was an investigator in the sexual assault unit and until, uh, I mean, I, I, I really, I really, genuinely, no, I really do have, um, I guess you'd say a breadth of knowledge of um, Attorney Krippendorf. He is and was the type of person that you would want by your side uh, handling these difficult cases. We handled, uh, as I said, sexual assault cases. Our victims were, you know, teenagers all the way up, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of the oldest, uh, you know, victim that we that we worked with, um, you know, in their 60s, 70s years old. And he would investigate these cases, go out into the community, work with the police departments, work with the victims, work with the families. These cases did not, they, they lasted sometimes for a year or two, but because of the hard work of him maintaining the connections with those people at every stage of the case, we were able to get those cases prosecuted. But without a team, uh, an investigator that you could rely on, and as I also stated, he went to law school during that time, so he was not just an investigator to me. He was, as I said, he was co-counsel with me on a Superior Court rape case, and um, he, uh, he talk about the real deal. Uh, this gentleman here is the real deal. He's got a well-balanced resume. He was a prosecutor. He's been a defense attorney. He's been an investigator. Uh, he really is, um, I am thrilled for the district court if you vote in his favor. I really am, so. Anyone else? All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Judge. Good to see you, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's kind of like being the principal of a middle school, huh? Thank you for your Thank you. Thank you very much. And our next witness, Mary Beth Brady. Thank you. So shut that door. It just annoys me. <laughs> thank you. <Ooh. laughs> worked. Well, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to be here to address thank you. Address you on behalf of Edward Krippendorf. I have been hoping for this moment for a long time, and I am so honored that he would choose me to be a witness on his behalf. Um, so I speak from my wonderful experience, personal and professional, with working with and admiring his accomplishments and strength of character throughout the years. In the 20 years that I have known him, there's not one specific quality that makes it that stand, makes him stand out in my mind, the combination of all that he brings to the court each day. 
During my 38 years of service to the Massachusetts Trial Court as an assistant clerk in the Suffolk Superior Criminal Court for 25 years, and as the clerk magistrate of the Malden District Court for more than 13 years, I have known Mr. Krippendorf as an investigator of the District Attorney's Office with Chief Justice Lyons, as an assistant district attorney, and as private counsel. In every interaction, he was prepared, professional, and personable, treating each person he encountered with dignity, respect, and compassion. While working with Justice Margot Botsford during the implementation of time standards in Suffolk County, it was a very busy, busy and demanding session. ADA Krippendorf had many complex and difficult cases before us, but he was, he was always fair, ready for trial, open to, to working towards a reasonable resolution of a case in the interest of justice for the victims and the accused. The experience that he has gained in each of these roles that he has, have, has given him a thorough perspective of all aspects of the district court jurisdiction, including criminal and civil law, mental health and substance abuse issues, diversity, inclusion, as well as language and cultural differences that impact access to justice in all of our courts. During his impressive career, Edward Krippendorf has earned a wonderful, well-deserved re reputation among judges, members of the bar, court personnel, and those who come before the court. He is intelligent, has excellent interpersonal skills, a calm demeanor, and the all-important judicial temperament. The humanity of the work that is done in the district court impacts the lives of those we serve in the most profound ways. I believe that Mr. Krippendorf has touched those lives with empathy, in all of the positions that he has held within the judicial system, making each process easier to navigate and less intimidating to understand, especially with his warm wit and sense of humor. In addition to my professional interaction with Ed Krippendorf, I, I have been a neighbor of his in Braintree and have witnessed his dedication to his wonderful family and commitment to mentoring children in sports and civic activities. He exemplifies leadership qualities and he and his family go out of their way to assist those around them always. I believe that he has worked his way up through the judicial system and has not forgotten where he came from. His qualifications speak for themselves and his commitment to public service in every facet of his life and career will make him eminently qualified to take on the challenge, challenges of a fast paced and busy district court. For all of the reasons that I have expressed and more, I believe that Edward Krippendorf is an outstanding candidate for judicial appointment to the Massachusetts District Court, and I thank you for your consideration. Thank you. That was great testimony. Thank you. Very, very well said. Thank you very much. Councilor Devaney. Uh, I'll yield to my <laughs> Kennedy. He's cheating bringing you in here. <laughs> no. That, right? no. I'm so honored. Where you spent the the former clerk of the Malden District Court. Wow. And you missed. No, well, I, I appreciate it. And honestly, I, I have to say, I am uh, uh, grateful that um, if, if chosen, he will be going to the district court because in all of my 38 years of experience, it is with, for me, the district court is where you really touch people's lives every day. You make a difference. And as clerk, I had the opportunity to set the tone for how I felt people should be treated when they came to the counter and a hearing in the courtroom. And I know that with uh, Mr. Krippendorf, hopefully his honor on the bench, he will bring that presence to the courtroom and, and to the, the team of clerks and, yeah. and staff, all of my staff. Um, you know, it, it goes without saying everywhere he's gone, he just has a gift with people. And, and that's rare sometimes these days, but I think he will serve the Commonwealth well. And it's wonderfully said. Thank you. Councilor Devaney. Oh, thank you. Sorry, Kennedy. Um, <laughs> This is a nice reunion for me. Very <laughs> real to to have two of the people that I so respect and I voted for. Uh, so good to see you, and you both look so. Good. I don't know if well, I'm going to talk to you later. Me, it's retired. <laughs> I can't believe you're retired. Uh, now, tell me, how many years uh, ago was it that you came here? In 2008, and I was uh, I was 25 years in 2000. Uh, 1983, I went to the Superior Court, but 2008 as the Clerk Magistrate. Wow, yeah, that, that's amazing. Um, no, I, I want to thank you both for your service, and um, I'm so proud to see people that I voted on that have done so well, and we get the feedback to hear how well you've done. So I hope you're enjoying your retirement. Right. Now, um, I, I know you've said all these attributes about the nominee. Is there one that you would say that comes out that you think he's going to bring to the, the court that is best attribute? 
I just I can't think of one just because you know there are so many and I've seen them in so many different capacities at you know, SDA as uh, an attorney and then just you know in my personal life and I just think he just brings that he he is as as the chief said the real deal you get what you what you see is what you get and the best is in him so I think the way it was always so important to me is how people are treated. do you feel like you know are you approachable do you listen you know and and I think whether whatever situation whether it's an adversarial role he was never an adversary he was always somebody that you could work with and well I'm telling you he's had two great role models and and I know I know and uh it was such a pleasure meeting you people and dying are all those good memories so thank you for coming back <laughs> but thank you your, your testimony both of you so much because you know him well decades this isn't someone you just, you know, saw a few times in court. So that means a lot to the council, and we thank you. Well, thank you. I was, I told him I'd be more nervous than you, but I, I, I mentioned every word was chosen correctly so that you could get a picture of him from my perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, council. I think I really appreciate what you shared and um, the history that you have, and um, I'm hoping you can answer the question, but I wanted, um, to know if you have any experience of how um, attorney Krippendorf responds to criticism or pushback or um, sort of a, you know, someone sharing where they feel like something different should be coming from him, what his, how you've experienced his response to that. No, I, think, I think he takes everything well. Um, in, in our very uh, busy session with Justice Botsford, you know, we could be a dynamic duo, duo and, uh, and, but he was always, you know, worked with you never got upset he just um you know and that's an attribute that some people can take things so personally but you know you can take it to heart and and maybe change your behavior but it wasn't personal and i and and, and there was never a negative thing to say about him <laughs> but um but just i you know like he, he could always take it and 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 learn from it and i think you know and as all of us you know we learn from the mentors in our lives the people that have, have helped us to get to where we are and you know it, it is such an honor to, to see somebody like this be in this position today and hope, hope for the best for him. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm good. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other witnesses? No other witnesses. Okay. Is there anyone else here who'd like to speak in favor? Anyone here who'd like to speak against? Chance. <laughs> okay. Hearing none. Um, we will open it up to you for your statement, but if you would first like to introduce any of your friends or family here, we'd love to hear who they are. Thank you. Um, well, I think the most important person in the room, all due respect to the counselors, is my wife, Peggy, who's there. Um, 20, coming up on 21 years. My oldest daughter, Maggie, oldest by an hour and a half. My son, Eddie. Um, my son, Sean, who's 13. Um, and then I have here, the Honorable William Galvin, my friend, Joe Eisenstadt, partner. Of course, we know Mary Beth. Her husband, Billy, is here also. Um, and Judge Lyons, Chief Judge Lyons. Um, hiding in the corner is um, my longtime friend, Richie DeMeo, who uh, gave me my start in the DA's office. He was our chief investigator there and hired me. Um, saw something and hired me and was very encouraging as I went to law school. Um, and then over here we have uh, Sue Connor, who was um, also a longtime friend from the DA's office. She was our um, administrative assistant, which is, I think, a, probably a lesser title than what she deserves uh, for 30 years there in the office, but kept us all well under control and was so good to all of us um, there. And then beside her is Elise Hershon, who's um, an attorney and friend, um, and here also thankfully supportive. Um, and uh, I think I think that's everybody who's who's here. Morning. All right, thank you, Councilor Ayanella has joined us. So we'll open with your opening statement. Thank you. Um, I'm going to cheat just a bit, though. That's all right. Uh, I'm so very pleased to be uh, before you today, and I'm grateful for your time, not only today, but also taking the time over the past two weeks to speak with me. I'd like to thank Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll for their trust and confidence in nominating me for this important position as an Associate Justice of the District Court. I'd also like to say thank you to Governor's Legal Counsel, uh, Paige Scott-Reed, who I see here, and Deputy Legal Counsel, Derek Kesselheim, who I also see here, 
uh, for all their time spent throughout the process, as well as uh, Valerie McCarthy and the entire staff who did so much to make this work possible. Um, I also want to say another thank you to uh, Chief Justice Lyons and Mary Beth Brady who, for their friendship and their kind words here today. I'm happy to have been given the opportunity today to tell you a little bit about myself and why I felt compelled to seek the governor's nomination and what I believe I would bring to the bench should you decide to confirm my nomination. It's impossible to do that, though, without telling you first something a little bit about the most important thing in my life, and that's my family. I grew up the youngest of three children to two wonderful parents who made it their business to serve their community uh, and their family. Both were incredibly hard workers, deeply religious people, and committed to community service, spending countless hours at church groups, town boards, committees, and community service groups. Growing up, they taught us so many of life's most important and fundamental principles. They taught us to always leave things better than how you found them, always treat others the way that you would want to be treated, and always ask if there's something that you can do to help. They had endless trademark catchphrases to reinforce these principles, such as make yourself useful as well as ornamental, which my sisters and I would often joke about. The reality is, though, that those lessons and principles that our parents drilled into us so often was no joke at all. It had become part of our DNA, part of our daily mission. And something that I notice to this day is that any time any of us, my sisters or I, walk into a room or if we meet someone having a bad day, it's instinctive habit to ask, what can I do to help? In fact, if I had to pick one guiding principle from them, it would be that, help others. On top of that, my parents preached and encouraged hard work and pursuit of education. I worked full time to pay my own way through law college and then again law school. Before and during law school, I worked in the Suffolk County DA's office as a civilian investigator, working out in the community and speaking and working with victims and witnesses to crimes. While in law school, I met my wife, Peggy, who was also working full time when we went to school. She had been my partner in all things ever since through law school. And to this day, she not only supports me, but she challenges me both personally and professionally. Without her, there is no scenario in which I am before you today. As soon as I graduated law school, I began work as a prosecutor in Suffolk County. My time spent prosecuting in the district court was invaluable to me because I was working with a number of extremely busy courts on a wide variety of different types of cases, each with their own individual circumstances. I quickly learned how to assess cases, work with a variety of different attorneys and court personnel, and of course, all of the personalities that came with them. Over the years in the DA's office, the cases I was working on became more complex and more in depth. The consequence of that was that I spent more and more time with the victims, the witnesses, and even defendants in my cases. My role began to get me more involved in their lives, and doing so, I found that they had as many commonalities as they did differences. For example, I saw defendants that were also victims of crimes at the same time, also victims or witnesses that may also have criminal cases open at the same time. I learned more about their struggles that they faced, such as substance use, housing issues, or prior victimizations that may have made them more vulnerable or may have led them into the position where they were charged with a crime in the first place. I worked as I worked to understand those issues, I became better equipped to work with the court and their attorneys to account for their issues, for example, when considering sentencing recommendations. But I also knew that I had the ability to become more involved in trying to address some of those issues in more meaningful ways if I had the chance. So with that guiding principle in mind, help others, I took a more broad approach to my work. After eight years, I left a former law firm with Joe and Bill, uh, two incredibly skilled attorneys who I've now known for 21 and 27 years, respectively, and I now consider them to be part of my family as well. My work as a private practitioner over the past 14 years has been unbelievably satisfying, and I've been able to meet and work with hundreds of clients in need, and I've learned so much just by working with them. The idea of helping others led me to learn different areas of law in order to help my clients. It called on me to commit myself to working with indigent clients so that they would have the same chance of competent representation as those who could afford it. It led me to act as a volunteer attorney of the day in probate court and to volunteer at legal clinics throughout the Norfolk Bar Association. It led me to donate my time as a court conciliator working with parties at times where they just couldn't seem to resolve their differences. My cases have allowed me to work with many, many clients suffering from major issues that we so often hear about, like mental health and substance use disorders. I've watched and worked with them as they struggle with their conditions. 
falling time and time again and hoping that someone is there to help them back up. But I've also worked with so many people that are facing other circumstances or hardships where we, or at least I, take so much for granted. But folks that don't have a consistent or safe place to live or are victims or abuse themselves or single parents who are struggling to try and balance a job, childcare, and are still being asked to meet their court obligations. Well, I hope my legal experience and abilities have helped me to help those clients. Truthfully, much of what I have learned and used to help people has come from talking with them and the people around them about their experiences and trying to work out ways that the court system can help them. I viewed my role as trying to learn, understand, and then advocate for them. In that role, I've appeared before so many judges all over the state at many different levels. And I've seen, particularly in the district court, the positive impact a judge can have over people's lives and well-being in ways I never could simply as an advocate. And that's what led me to apply to this position. Through all my experiences over the last 20 plus years, I've learned and developed within myself so many things that I believe are critical to being a good district court judge, almost like a recipe of how do you make a good judge. But the importance of being sure everyone feels that they have been fully heard and understood. The importance of understanding that people are fallible and they make mistakes, but that they deserve our compassion and understanding. But mostly I learned that the district court is fundamentally a community court and should use its ability to involve all available resources simply to help others. I sincerely hope that you'll give me that opportunity and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, sir. Councilor Devaney. Oh, thank you. Oh, nice to see you again. Good to see you. You know, uh, I don't have a polka face. I am just so pleased that you applied and that you have been nominated. Um, you are the type of person that we look for because not only have you had a lot of criminal cases, but you have worked both sides. So you, you, you know, you're real um, you can identify with the people coming into the court too. You you did be going along with the silver spoon in your mouth. So having said that, um I want to ask you about um how how it's changed since you have been on the wheel. How uh, the court has changed. Um we see a different um family uh, you know perspective. We see um so many things that are coming up before a judge, and we talked about that. I said, you know, 50 years ago, you just didn't have the things that that you will face, you know, and tough decisions. But um, one of the things I wanted to go back to in your criminal cases, there was one, and I remember it. I remember that Revere police officer being killed, and it was first degree murder. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I can't go through all of the cases, but that I remember, and I, I'd like you to tell us about that. Hey, yeah, it was a, it, and we we talked about it. I think uh, the other day when we met, but it was uh, obviously a very troubling case. It was a very serious case. It was a um, something you know. Anytime, obviously, there's a there's a death to somebody that it involves a, a lot of serious issues, and there were a lot of complexities to it as well. Um, so it was uh, it was a case that involved uh, one young men were actually charged, but. Uh, coming uh, through this area where there were these uh, police officers there. They were off-duty police officers, but they had just come from some training and so still had some of their equipment with them and so forth. And there was an exchange and um, one of the one of the men um, fired and, and killed one of the um, police officers. Um, so it obviously had a lot of consequence to it for a variety of different reasons. Had a lot of consequence to the community over the year, had a lot of consequence to the uh, you know the, the victims and their family um, and it was a long trial uh, and there was a lot to it um, but one thing that i talked about was that uh, i think during the course of that time what because it was a long trial and i thought sort of spoke to this is it was a four or five week trial and over the course of that time you know you're in court with the same people over and over and of course we're working with the you know the um, police officers family and and all the other folks from that community who were there in support of them. But as well, you know, what I started to notice over the course of that time too was that the, the individual that was charged, he was there and his family was there. There were a lot of people that were there in support of him as well. And so we would come in over the course of this long trial back and forth, in and out, 
Well, his parents were there. They were there every single day in the front row, and they were there in support of him. And there was a lot, obviously, a lot more. You know, you could take that scenario and you could say, "This is somebody who shot and killed somebody." No end of discussion. But there really was a lot more to it, and there were a lot more of the circumstances, and there was a lot more to him and his family and his background that you started to notice over the course of time. And as you come in, even just coming in and out of the courtroom with those people and starting to kind of identify that these are people. And, and at the end of the day, in all the homicide cases that really you deal with, at the end of the day, you know, you're in the courtroom and you get a mom and you get a mom in front. And there they are, and there's two different families that are there, and really there's kind of no winners to it. I think that was the other thing. Uh, one of the things judges didn't uh, have before them 30, 40 years ago is uh, child pornography. And we see too often now. You did have a case. Do you want to talk about that? I mean, I, I, we, we have handled those types of cases, and obviously they're pretty disturbing, uh, you know, disturbing things to deal with. But, um, you know, we've we've handled those types of cases in the past. And that you, that you, in, in your, um, you can't see, it's, um, a term we had, it was for, let me see, it was with Richard Sweeney and his yeah. co-defendant, Brian. Yes. I do remember the case, yeah. And it was, you know, obviously, again, it's a, it's their troubling circumstances that, and they're not things that, uh, that we, you know, obviously, uh, you know, look well on. However, this was two, two people that were there, um, and it was, uh, there were two brothers that were both charged. That's why there was a co-counsel in it. Um, and I think, you know, the thing that was important to me in, that, in those circumstances is, once again, there are a lot more circumstances to, uh, um, you know, kind of the, the person and what it was that brought them to that position where they were charged with that offense to be made with. And that, in that case, we spent a lot of time, most of the time that we spent was not so much on, you know, can they prove that this happened or not happened, but can we talk about what's going on in the lives of these two um, people that brothers, two twin brothers that were charged in connection with it um, and try and shed some light on it in terms of what it was that got them to this place. What kind of treatment options can we put into place? What is going to make, you know, the government or the, the DA in that case feel safe and feel that they're accomplishing their goals while at the same time trying to make sure that, you know, nobody's victimized and that nobody is um, and that this is something that's going to, um, you know, result mm -hmm. favorably. I'm concerned about racial discrimination. Do you see it in court? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think we see it in lots of different ways. It comes in a lot of forms. Um, and we see it in different areas. It can, whether it's in, you know, charging, just it can start everything from, from every place from charging decisions. Um, and, and some of the folks that, that I represent now, you know, um, of the nature of our job, we get to, you know, we have clients that are, um, that are a family of, you know, very wealthy people. And we also have, you know, I, you know, a lot of these um, folks that, that can't afford attorneys and indigent folks or um, people that we deal with in the clinics. And you do see that um, it can be community by community or it can be person by person, but some of the charging decisions. Can... And I know, and, and, and the councils know it does exist. And uh, we don't have a crystal ball as counselors. We can have someone there that, you know, um, is pure as the dirt and snow, and we don't know. And they disappoint us. You know, I saw, that, you know, we, we see the, um, oh, I don't know, we just saw a little Humphrey girl that was killed by her father. And, you know, and that judge hasn't been responsible for it. Cool. And I called Judge Butler here because I didn't want him to have being the refollows. He was the one that could have sent her to a loving foster home, but instead he gave it to a vicious father who admitted he was beating her up and he killed her. And yet he went off scot free. I'm not letting that go. I'm not letting it go. And, and he should be, he should be, and, and to give him the benefit after he tried to be on. You can get in the first one. But um, that really concerns me. How about gender? Do you see that? Because that's that was never in the court 30, 40 years ago. I don't even know if you have something to go by, uh, you know, past history or whatever on these type of things. 
Well, I think I think whether it comes to the, the racial issues, which I do think exist, and I do think they exist not only with the charger, but also in in the court and how the court conducts itself. And I think that it's something that's a, a troubling thing to see. I think that, but I do think that the solution is to be open you know, from people about what their experiences are and making sure that you're and checking right. yourself to make, you know, be open to listening to you know, kind of people checking you on it. And I think that with the gender things, you know, we see that coming in as well. And we see lots of people who, uh, who do come with different gender issues in the court and a lot more so um, than at least when I started, uh, which, you know, in a way it can be great because it means that people are comfortable with, with, you know, themselves and are comfortable enough to be, um, you know, talking about those issues rather than you know, being too scared or too not comfortable with the court. I think the court needs to do everything it can to adapt to that. And, um, you know, if people come in with issues uh, regarding that, either racial or gender, um, being open to, you know, hearing from their advocates, and that's something that I think as an attorney was part of my role, is to ensure that I'm informing the court or the clerks or whoever, Here's what's going on here. Here's what we need to try and adapt to. This is, you know, no longer kind of a rigid system, and we need to, you know, be discussing things and talk about ways that we can make sure that this person feels comfortable in being here. Or if, um, and I think we also talked about, um, you know, um, in terms of people that are in custody. You know, I've had yeah. folks that are in custody that, um, you know, one of, you know, our roles. Either as an advocate or as a judge is to make sure that if they're going to be in custody, that they're in a comfortable place. They're where they want to be. They're safe. They're, you know, they're not going to have any issues. Um, so whatever, you know, whatever gender they are or whatever gender they identify as. The other thing is, um, um, I'm very happy that in years that we do have, um, we have specialty for us. I think it's necessary for drugs, for veterans and everything. Um, what um, interaction have you had with the special courts? The specialty courts, I think, are probably one of the most important developments over the past 20 years that I've been practicing. And it started, you know, um, started sort of small with drug, some drug courts, and then it expanded out with the mental health courts and the veterans courts. And there's almost no um, no limit to where you could start to get into some specialty court issues because I think the value in it is that collaborative approach of spending some time with an individual person, following them through the system, making sure that there are trained people who are there that can talk about the issues, people that are far smarter than me about um, any of the social services that they need, any mental health services that they need, and the ability to, you know, to, as a judge, the ability to um, get everybody gathered together in a room. In your position, in the district court, you can't do all those things that you really need some specialty court to do that. And I especially like the drug graduations that people don't know. We do have good programs out there. And these are people who have been addicted for years, decades. And I go, I sit in the back, no one knows who I am. And tears come to my eyes because these are people that their whole lives was, was ruined. Uh, addiction, and they talk about what the program did for them and how they had been successful. So there's a lot of good things that that are going up. You know, I wasn't going to ask you, but um, but um, Kirk Magistrate um, had brought it up about time standards. I haven't heard that in years. Tell me, do you, are you with time standards? Where is it in the court system in 2024? Tell the Chief Justice, but I. Not a huge fan you know, of the time stands can be very difficult. But again, because my 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 thinking when it comes to the cases, and this is one of the great benefits to things like the specialty courts, is you know, you know, when you talk about drug courts or mental health courts, these are people that a number of times may have setbacks, they may have problems, they may have issues. And one of the benefits is that you're taking the time that you need to not just sort of cut the person off and say, okay, well, you had your chance, now we're gonna sentence you. And so I think that. Time standards, you know, can get in the way of us spending the time that we need to make sure, you know, oftentimes I have people, even if it's not a specialty court situation, this is someone who, before we can really figure out what is best for them or what is best for the system or what makes the most sense, we need to get some evaluations done. We may need to check in with a, you know, a mental health specialist and have them check for something, or they may have, you know, hospitalizations along the way or they, whatever the issues are, it just come up. 
Yeah. There are cases that go on far past the time standards issue. I agree with you. I agree with you. And I, I, I admit my ignorance. I didn't know that it was still going on. So it's still in the court, the time standards? It's in the court, but I would say, I do, I do, I would say also, I remember when they came out and I was in the Superior Court at the time, and it was a very, very, very rigid thing. And I think that what most judges, especially those of us who have, who have dealt with it as practitioners, as we come in, recognize that, um, you know, Parties know what's best for the case. And unless somebody is really complaining about, hey, this person's dragging their feet or this is a problem I have, you know, there are circumstances when you have to move the case along. And we certainly don't want to have cases that are lingering for forever. You know, there has to be some conclusion to it. But I think that in, in, our, in my experience, the parties know what's best for the case. And the parties... Um, you know, we've had people singing... Um, yeah. Counsel, your time is... is coming to an end you put time to know they voted to time i'm against time because i think some sometimes you need to ask more we'll the same thing, thing. And have to answer more but anyway i'm kind of i'm done but i thank you for all the time with the you. it was wonderful you're going to bring the kids and um, i'm very pleased and uh, you have you know both sides of the aisle i, I couldn't be more pleased thank, thank you. you thank you council i and ella just I want to use up all your time, but my answer is no. I mean, it, it just doesn't. Because a lot of times, uh, and we talked about this during the main conversation, uh, lawyers, uh, you know, we have Kennedy, for, uh, the Paolo, Julie uh, Bill before that. Uh, they're busy. They're in multiple courts a day. So it's tough sometimes, you know, to uh, adhere to the time standards. Uh, and for whatever reason, people are on vacation, whatever, and case come in. So cases do get continued, and I hope, and I think we talked about it, you're going to be one of those judges that if it's a legitimate reason that you're going to agree to continue this. Yeah, I, again, I think the parties know what's best, and um, and it is. I've, I've certainly asked for plenty of continuances in my day, and I think also, having practiced in the criminal area so much, you know, uh, my clients are not, um, it's hard to schedule, you know, when they may have an issue. So things come up, things come up in your personal life, things come up with other cases and other clients, and you have to have that flexibility to be able to move. Maybe you like defendants uh, who are in custody to be uh, safe and comfortable, I think we your words. Is that the role of the judge? Can you? I think it's the role of the judge to make, you know, comfortable, I think, in the sense that if you, I think I was answering in the context of, you know, potential gender issues or things like that. But I think it's for sure it's the role of the judge to make sure that with they're going to some place that's, um, that they're going to be safe in, in where they're going and that they're going to, and that if they're, if they have needs or services or medications, for example, and that's and I think judges do have the ability to make sure that things get communicated to department. They have to enact it. I mean, Department of Corrections or the Sheriff's Department, it's their role to actually enact that. But I think it's part of, you know, if if I'm a judge and I'm going to sentence somebody to a term of commitment, I, don't, I think I need to be mindful of whether or not it's going to put somebody in danger. And, um, you know, they uh, so at least to make sure that somebody knows that it's an issue. Maybe I'm naive. I didn't realize it was that such a problem. I mean, you practice in Plymouth County. Yeah, uh, Plymouth uh, County is a majority of place I practice. Yeah. Right. I get the impression, maybe I'm wrong, that judges have sentenced defendants to House of Correction or wherever to some unsafe places. Because I've never heard this unsafe until today. Are you suggesting? I'm not. That that you know of judges who send these people and, and wherever they go, whatever facility, that they must say. I'm not suggesting that at all, and I haven't seen it happen. But what I do, what I, I've 
And be very clear, I've not seen that happen. I haven't had instances where that happened. What I have had and what I think is important to have the ability to do is to communicate with the judge and say, I have somebody who has this issue, if they're going to be sentenced or if they're going to be held pending a trial or something, there's some issue. They have some medication that they need or they have some special need that needs to be addressed. Can you please make sure that gets put on the minimus? Can you please make sure that gets communicated to the to the sure. correction center? That's all I'm saying. I'm not. Th th this is. If if I gave that impression, that's not the impression. I'm going to be We have a lengthy conversation. Uh, you know, we talked about a variety of uh, topics. I like the fact that we're in private practice. You know, uh, you have other people. Uh, small law firm, uh, prestigious law firm. I remember David Eisenstadt, one of the most super guy uh, he, he was. Um, but, you know, when your name comes before the council, I mean, what would happen to you? Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Kennedy. I think that's going to have to do a lot of work with you and Galvin. <laughs> and, um, we're not going to be able to meet any time standards. That's what he's going to expose us as the, the true gonna worker. Be, it's going to make a lot of money, too, I think. Still working sometimes. Um, the, uh, I'm not a big believer in time standards either. I think that shocking for every <laughs> and not forced across the board. It's it just it's court to court, and, the, and they just don't make sense to me. But uh, how about fifty-eight days? Are they overused by prosecutors? Yes. Uh, how are you going to take all your time? But yes, sorry to take all your time, but yes, it's a short answer. I expect you to say that. Uh, because that's certainly the case. They seem to be filing them more and more and more. And you know what happens when they file it? Somebody gets locked up. Sometimes they get locked up for uh, for a crime that even if they're convicted, they're not going to get a jail sentence. So we're putting people in jail on uh, pre-trial who um, may never go to jail for that case, but they're in there. And I, I have a big problem with that. How are you going to handle it when a prosecutor files a 58A on someone that they're probably not going to jail for anyway? And here we are, the day of the arraignment. You got to handle that motion. What are you going to do? I'm going to ask for three days. As the prosecutor, when you ask for three, three days? I mean, I do think it's something that's from the time that I started, it was a very rare event. And now I, I do see it a lot. And one of the problems that I see I do with it is that um, is when they're filed and then you come back in those three days, and I've seen this too much, is you come back in those three days and they have either, the prosecutor is either agreeing that this person shouldn't be held without bail and they're going to agree to some conditions or, you know, the case has changed dramatically. So I think the first thing I'm going to do- Happens all the time. Is ask a lot of questions about the case and how, and whether or not this is really what they want to do. And I think you can ask them to have a hearing right there as far as whether or not this is something that's appropriate. Well, let me ask you, if you give them the three days, why do you get to lock the person up? They can have the hearing in three days. Or they could have the hearing then. I mean, I think that's what the statute calls for. Okay. Uh, what about pretrial conditions? Do you think they're overused? I think a number of them are. I think if they're if they're specifically tailored to that case, then um that I think would be appropriate. But I think trying to get a feeling of comfort out of just making a the longer your list of pretrial conditions, I'm not sure that that accomplishes what our goals are. Yeah. Our goals are to make sure that people are safe or people in the court or you know we have certain set goals and the length of that list shouldn't shouldn't be done over the quality of the list. And so whether it's uh you know GPS which is used an awful lot Having that very specifically tailored, or um, if used at all, so it's, some judges will put somebody on a GPS. And there's no exclusion. Right. Yeah. So any doing that, <laughs> had that happen, and you know, and it's and it's and even still, I think the other issue is the more of those conditions that you have, somebody has to monitor those conditions. And if there's a violation of those conditions, what's your reaction to that? Is it an instant, you know, um, having somebody placed into custody, or is it is there some further explanation of why there was a, a violation of that condition or not? And I that I favor the second, which is, you know, not to kind of jump to any conclusions about okay that, you know, that number four on your conditions have been violated, so that's it. Yeah. You know, a lot of times I know you know this. A lot of times as a defense lawyer. 
uh, when somebody files that motion, you're almost forced into stipulating the dangerousness because if you let them put a witness on the stand, you just preserve the testimony that can convict your client later. Mm -hmm. Um, so you, you're sitting there and you say, all right, we'll stipulate. And then what you're arguing about is those conditions, what they should be. And, um, they can be pretty intrusive on people's lives. They can affect their, uh, their jobs. They can affect their, uh, uh relationships with their families, uh, all kinds of things that, uh, that I, I personally think they're way over you everywhere right now. Uh, and. Your city judge Krippendorf sitting there. Terry Kennedy's there with the, the prosecutor just filed the motion on his client, uh, Joe Ferrara standing there. And um, we don't want him out for three days. We don't want to preserve the testimony. So, all right, we'll agree he's dangerous. Even if we don't really agree that he's dangerous, we're going to do that. Now the prosecutor's giving you this whole list of conditions they're looking for. And I'm saying, how about just a stay away judge? What, what's Judge Krippendorf going to do in that situation? I think if the if the facts and circumstances dictate that it just to stay away is is appropriate, and it's going to keep people safe and and make sure that you know there's not a issue of danger. I'm fine with that. Um, we've obviously sat down a couple of times prior to you sitting here today. Uh, we've talked a lot. Um, I, um, I I I have to vote for you so that my phone stops ringing. Um, <laughs> When people calling me, telling me what a great guy you are, and I go, yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know. And from everywhere, I, I got a text yesterday from Brian Merrick. Mm -hmm. uh, Derek Merrick, uh, uh, we all uh, like a lot. And, you know, it's a very touchy-feely message, and we know what a touchy-feely person he is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but the, uh, it, it just, I've gotten a lot of phone calls. Funny. A lot of, more than I have probably for, Certainly, a lot more than I got on Gallup. Uh, uh, so I'll be voting for you next week. You're going to be a terrific judge. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor DePaolo. Thank you, Councillor. Morning. Good morning. Um, could you share your thoughts on raising the age of juvenile jurisdiction? Um, I am. I think that the court has done a very good job at recognizing the issues with the juvenile um, mind. I am in favor of it. I've been in favor of um, I've had instances where it's where it's been an issue for young folks. One is I know I, I spoke to a couple people about a client that um, that I had very early on who was 17 years old at the time that she was charged with a very, very serious offense, also involved in a shooting. She had really just turned to 17, in fact. Um, I think she turned 17, I think in October, and this incident happened in November. And this was in 2011 I think, or 12 that it happened. Um, had she, it involved a, a, an armed robbery, it involved a shooting. Um, she was with two other people. She was, you know, the getaway driver, but was charged just the same as everybody else. So it was charged with some very, very, very serious offenses. Had she done that two years later, she would have been a juvenile. But because she did it at that time, she was charged as an adult. She ended up going to state prison as a 17 year old girl. Um, she spent a number of years there. Um, I remain in touch with her. She has she got out. She finished all of her probation. She is uh, either just or is graduated. I'm not sure when the graduation is, but we spoke recently. She's graduated college. She has a job. She's doing fantastic. However, um, for lots of people, that may not be the case. And she was treated as an adult, and luckily she came through with lots of family support. And, you know, we worked with her on probation afterwards. But I'm mindful of the fact that this was a very young girl who was charged with a very serious offense. And, and it seems arbitrary to me that had that same set of facts, same thing happened two years later, she would have been a juvenile and she would have no record. You know, she would have no criminal conviction for a felony. And I think that happens a lot. And I think that, you know, the, the SJC in, in this state has done a lot of good work at examining it, listening to the experts. They're the ones who know a lot more about the, the brain than we do. And um, a lot of those efforts and, you know, I've read the materials and they, um, again, I think relying on the experts uh, is probably the um, better course of action than just kind of coming up with this arbitrary date saying that's that's the date that we're gonna now you're an adult. B 
being mindful of that and being mindful of the, I'm sorry. No, no, please go ahead. I think I was going on on you, but. I appreciate what you're saying. Please continue. I think being mindful of that is important. You know, just like every other condition that we're mindful of when we're thinking about sentencing and when we're thinking about charging decisions and things like that, the age should be no different. And I think, you know, the emerging adult issue is, is a real live one and one that's being dealt with. For me, some of these issues uh, connect to safety and in a totally different context, you can talk, well, not necessarily totally different, but you're talking about unsafe, be mindful of sending someone to an unsafe situation. Um, there was a recent case in Superior Court um, where a student presenting with some severe mental health uh, challenges um, was ordered back to her public school um, in spite of overwhelming evidence that she was not equipped to succeed there. And on top of it, that it really wasn't a safe place for her, not because of the people in the building, but because of what she was walking in with. And to the judge's credit, um, after in a conference, the, the Globe quoted the judge saying, it's not as if I'm sending her to a dangerous place. You know, and there was an incident when the girl returned to school. And to the judge's credit, the order was reversed. But to me, it speaks to a notion of, I mean, that's an incredible case of bias, where the bias was, I, this is tough love for this child who needs to be in school. And my experience in school was X, Y, Z. And that's going to be this child. It's what's in the best interest of the child. And I'm wondering, um, you know, I'm wondering if, as a judge, you're able to. You've, you've written extensively in your application that this is your mindset. But, you know, how willing are, how aware are you of your biases? How have you ever caught yourself checking your bias in a situation like that, or perhaps totally different? Um, I, yeah, I, I, certainly I've not always made the right decisions. And I think that's one of the, th one of the things that I, I think, and I know the judge, I know that case you're talking about. And I thought the fact that she, um, you know, recognized it was able to kind of, uh, you know, uh, not dig or dig heels in to say, sorry, that's a decision I made. And I have tremendous respect for, for that. Yeah. And I think, you know, at the time probably thought that she was doing the best that she could for that person. I think, um, you know, I've certainly identified um, ways, the, the longer I've been, particularly the longer I've been out into private practice and the more people I've dealt with in different contexts, whether they be with, uh, you know, some of the mental health issues or, um, you know, the drug, you know, drug, drug issues and things like that that folks have had um, from the time that I was a prosecutor, uh, or even, you know, folks that have housing issues. The time that I was a prosecutor, the time that the more time I spend with them, you know, I can see that there have that there were areas where, you know, maybe I didn't make the right decision, even as a prosecutor, or in the beginning stages of when I've been out representing people would sort of put them into a category of almost a similar mindset of, you know, I know what's best, and I think I know what's right, and this has been my experience with something, so I don't understand what the big deal is. But the more time that I've spent with some of those people, um, deal, you know, and their families, you know, and some of the collaterals that that really are sometimes the most help. Sure. Um, the, the interest, I don't know, it's an odd situation, but there was um, the one that I think about is on a fairly recent basis is maybe a year or two years ago. And this was um, an industry client that I was helping in, in, in Brockton and um, he, um, he was from Haiti, and so there was an interpreter that was there uh, with us helping out. And um, he was talking about, um, uh, and he had some mental health issues at the same time. But he was talking about some things that really just um, uh, seemed odd to me. It didn't make, I thought it was sort of part of his mental health. And so I sort of discounted some of the things he was talking about, um, you know, because he was talking about, um, you know, uh, that th his, his, wife had dolls about him and things like that. And it just didn't make sense to me. And I sort of discounted it. Uh, and as we were leaving, the interpreter said, hey, listen, I had to this is part of their religion. This is part of what he really, this is a real thing for him. And that's what he really, that's how he grew up. And this is a real sect of what they believe in. And, um, you know, that's, that's not part of, you know, some of the things that he, he misunderstood. And it was a good checking for me, I thought, to say, okay, this is not 
you know, this is something that he believes it's part of his religion. And that is um, something I have to take into account. And I think I was too quick in that in that circumstance to sort of lump it in with everything else. Um, it also gave me a lot, you know, it was, uh, it gave me a lot more um, consideration for, you know, that's one more person that we can rely on to help us to understand other people's cultures and other people's backgrounds and religions. You know, sometimes even just the interpreter can help you to talk about what these, you know, what people grew up and how they grew up or what, how they grew up in their country when they come here and things like that. I think it, you know, having those types of experiences and at least recognize them and stopping and say, okay, that was a little bit quick on that. And uh, I think she's right. And, you know, I'm not sure really why I went there. Um, and I think it's important for judges too to have that and not be. I think the most important thing that we can do, whether it's a, a, an attorney or a judge or any of us, is to not be defensive about that type of a thing. And if somebody says, hey, I think you're missing this, um, to be open to hearing it and not sort of take it as a criticism, um, no matter how they deliver it. But Thank you. Um, I'll jump around real quick before I'm done, because a lot of my colleagues have hit important issues. Um, Councilor Devaney brought up uh, race, race in our courts. And the Gantt study at this point, I would say is kind of dated. The data in it is dated. I'm wondering, and, and in that study, it was really focused on sentencing and a lot of the sentencing disparities were in superior court for a million reasons. But in your role, and I'll jump on something Council Kennedy was talking about, like 58 days, for example, are they disproportionately uh, given to defendants of color? One thing I liked about the Gantt um, report was, was that nobody can really deny the statistic, you know, when you're talking about numbers and you're talking about statistics, it is what it is. And so this, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to really argue about that too much you know, when you're dealing with conclusions. Are statistics being gathered adequately in your opinion to make sure that we're on top of this issue? I, I think that I have seen a lot more work done today than I did even five years or 10 years ago. I mean, in very recent years, and I, I can recall spending time when I was in the, even in the BMC, where there would be folks in there collecting data on big issues of bail um, was one, you know, one big one is 58 days. And I understand that's a big issue because it, it's an on off switch. You're in custody or you're not, but even just bails. I mean, because you can have a 58 day where somebody is being held without bail, but with a lot of folks, a, a thousand dollar bail is the same net effect meaning there's no chance in the world that they're going to make that. So I think gathering that data is important and and because it also, you know, sort of holds that mirror up to the court to say, hey, listen, maybe this is not what you intend or this is not what you think you're doing, but it is something that is happening. It's the it's the result of what's happening. So you need to be a little bit more careful about this and make sure that that's not part of the calculus. So um, it does it happen. I believe that it does. Um, is it intentional? I don't know that it's an intentional thing. I think it's something that you know we all constantly have to grapple with and constantly have to recheck and make sure that you know somebody's telling us when we think that we're off. Um, but I do I do see them gathering information. I think it's helpful. I think for all judges, it's helpful to know what you know. They may not remember day to day. You hold handle you know, so many cases and so many things come through, and I don't think we can expect them day to day to remember everything that they do. But to to say this is kind of your trend. And this needs to be addressed. Uh, I'll just note that as a student, I spent a summer overlapping with your time in the DA's office. We never interacted because I was in different divisions, but I appreciated my time here there. So I thank you for your service in that role. Um, 209 A's. Have you had occasion professionally to interact with 209 A's? I have on both sides, but you know, I've represented people on both sides of them. Um, it's all anecdotal, of course, right? In my world, people I talk to, uh, they say one thing that they think was a little awry sometimes is judging, judges taking too much into account regarding the impact on the alleged perpetrator in 209As. Um, so uh, occasions where um, you know the person's work will be impacted, and so we're gonna go a little, we're not gonna put in an order to protect the victim. Right. I'm wondering what your thought. It's a very difficult balance. I'm wondering your take. I think it is. I, I think, as with lots of uh, lots of areas that they deal with, it is a difficult balance. I think you're balancing lots of different interests in all these cases. The two nine A's are no different. I think, anecdotally speaking, I think the issue I have in 
enough time is spent discussing, you know, either having the hearing or, you know, sort of just, you know, um, uh, listen, someone was charged, so we're just going to issue an order, you know, period and end uh, without considering everything. But, you know, I think that's not part of what you're supposed to be considering is what the effect is on them. Um, you know, for a reason, that's not part of the, you know, that's not part of what the 29, you know, there's a purpose in the 29A order. It's for safety, it's to protect people. And, um, and if we were going to err, would you say you'd err on the side of safety? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I think, I, I think that that's the, that's the, that's the motive is to make sure that somebody is safe. That's the whole purpose in having them. Um, so if somebody's reasonably in fear, then that order should issue, irrespective of, you know, their police officer or whatever, however it's going to affect them. Um, or their job, they can't do the job. Mm -hmm. You know, people have found ways around it. So, thank you for your time, and I appreciate your well, thank you on these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Jacobs. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Hi. Uh, Hi. Good to see you again. We had um, a really great conversation, covered a lot of areas, and. As the room has taken their turns, a lot of the areas I was going to bring up have already been addressed. Um, I think one of the few areas that uh, we talked about um, that I have a lot of interest in that hasn't come up is around the area of gender bias in the courts, both from the standpoint of attorney wellness, so hearing from women um, attorneys practicing uh, in court, appearing in court, who, are, who have a wide range of stories around um, sort of categorizing their, um, their tone or um, lack of respect, things like that. And the other side, and I'm sure there's multiple, multiple elements we could talk about, but the other one that comes up a lot uh, in conversations I've been having are around um well, the the sense that court is not necessarily a safe space for victims of domestic violence or sexual assault or in other ways you know people who have already experienced trauma where court can another layer of trauma through particularly through um, interactions with judges who may marginalize um, their experience or um, again, categorize their experience as something minimal, and and um, and sometimes because it's a it's a traumatizing experience, the articulation of what happened isn't always as um, clear necessarily, um, or articulated in a way that lands for the judge. So it's sort of a brush away of like that doesn't sound so bad. Um, all of that to say, I'm I'm interested in hearing your thoughts um, about the the your perception of um, gender equity uh, in the courts and what you could bring in your role as the district court judge to affect some positive cultural changes there, Norms. Um, well, thank you um, for the question. I, I know we discussed, and I think one of the biggest things that I um, always have in my head is my, my wife, as you know, is, a, is an attorney and we came up together and we were prosecutors at the same time in two different offices, but, um, you know, she's a pretty impressive attorney in her own right. And so we talk a lot and we know a lot of the same people, uh, you know, in the different courts and my experiences as a prosecutor, my experiences as, as an attorney and hers. Um, and so, um, very first, um, you know, I don't want to say first hand because it's really her first hand, but. I'm very familiar with, you know, the differences in how sometimes we treated uh, for the same, doing the same thing, acting the same way. Um, I think when we're prosecuting the same argument or prosecuting the same case, and um, you know, we talk about it, and I think it's something to be aware of, um, and something to try and be mindful of when you're dealing with people. Again, um, you know, we can all, you know, we all have experiences where we have. You know, maybe misstepped or, you know, um, maybe not been as as mindful about something as as we could be or should be or or out of a place of just not understanding something or not understanding that something's an issue, um, having done something that's either offensive to the person or is taken the wrong way. That's why I think that the most important thing is that people feel comfortable in saying, hey, that's not a great way to address this person or that's 
do you did you notice that that person you know was tough and that person was nasty and that was really that's the only difference um being open to that and i think mindful of it and okay and saying okay i, I think i see that um is important but it's something that at least i've lived with over the past 20 years you know having two of us going through a lot of those same process at the same time um, and I think it's recognized by lots of other people in the report that, that I think gave a lot, shed a lot of light, a lot of people, myself included, you know, when you read through it, and there's so many different areas that it covers that, frankly, we just haven't, hadn't thought about maybe, um, you know, whether it be how you're addressing people or how you feel or how they're dressed, um, you know, uh, in court and things like that, small, subtle things that, can either make somebody feel more comfortable or can make somebody feel like they're stepping onto an alien planet and um you know do their best work when they're in court and they're feeling comfortable people who come in as witnesses or victims are are doing are you know being the most effective when they feel comfortable and when they feel like someone's going to listen to them or they feel like there's been some accommodation made for them again that's where i think that part of my role as an advocate for them to alert somebody you know alert the clerk alert the court officers alert the judge hey this witness is coming in this is their issue is there some place i can because this is not a great place to have them trouble um you know i can recall a case where uh actually i was the defense attorney and, and there was a victim who came in who just had a massive teddy bear uh, with the hood up and um was just holding holding the bear and had the hood up and asked me if there was an issue with it. And you know, I don't think that's you know, that's not the issue. She's coming in to say her piece and so she's gonna say her piece. I think it's then incumbent on the a judge to be to make sure that they're expressing themselves as being approachable so that those advocates in my role, one of the harder things that I would have to deal with is from judge to judge, can I talk to them? Can I approach them? Are they gonna be okay if I go to sidebar and say, Hey, listen, I have this client who has um, a traumatic brain injury and is prone to outbursts or comes across this way, but don't misinterpret that. We have a judge that will take me at sidebar, will listen to it and say, okay, we'll make those accommodations. Or some judges just are not really open to it. They don't feel approachable. They don't feel like there's somebody that you can have that kind of not legal conversation with. Um, so to the extent that you can make the court someplace that is not just a... Um, you know, kind of a meat grinder of just this case comes in, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and then move out. Something that's more a, a place where people can come in and there may be things to discuss first to make sure that things get set up in the right way or make a comment. And the, some of the accommodations we can make now, and we could talk to the courts about, um, you know, some of the te technological things that we've been able to do. You know, folks with disabilities or you know they may not be comfortable in the court or whatever it is uh, that years ago i can remember were the one in a million where you may videotape somebody or, or have somebody remote and the whole process to set up people didn't want to do it and make things hard and now i think the technology has just allowed us to be much accommodating and, and be comfortable so well, I appreciate all that you said, and you touched on uh, one of the other areas that I'm uh, particularly interested in hearing. Uh, touch on so just a little more about that. That's around the area of people with whether it's TBIs or cognitive delays, development, executive function type delays, or um, otherwise struggle with participating in proceedings. Um, processing language or, or decision making or, or, or comprehension or what have you and um i have heard frustration about a lack of accommodations um and sensitivity around that but i'm curious to hear your thoughts further well i, I mean i'm sensitive to it you know I've, I've experienced it you know personally not myself but with family members um but it also i think that we're we can sometimes run into a problem in the court system is that there's a bit of a gap between someone who is not, you know, we have a legal standard, someone who's not competent to stand not responsible, and there are legal standards. And then there's, you know, folks like you and I that may not have any, any issues whatsoever. There's a lot of people in between that 
don't meet the burden of being not competent to stand trial, but have a lot of difficulty with understanding the process or may need to have things explained more. Or, you know, um, you know some traumatic brain injury, something that happened suddenly in their life or something that they were born with, just different in some way that the, they're in that middle path gap and that they, it's not something that would stop the process like a competency issue. It's something that should slow the process and allow us to take the time to make sure that we're managing them, be sure that they're being tra treated fairly, reasonably, and are being heard. I think the most important thing to come out of any court experience on either side, whether you're a defense attorney or a prosecutor, whether you're the victim or the defendant, or whether whoever you are that's coming in there, the most important thing when you walk out the double doors out the back is that you have felt that you were heard in the experience. And if you are having trouble communicating that, you think either I didn't get the time or they couldn't understand what's going on or I didn't understand what they were saying, um, that affects that feeling when you leave. So. I think that addressing that middle gap of, of folks that are just maybe aren't at that place, but they are also, you know, they need something more than than I might. Um, and again, I think that's some place where, to the extent that the courts, the clerks, the judge, and the judge sort of sets the tone for how that court's going to be. But to, to the extent that that clerk or the court officers or everybody that's participating in that knows that, that people can come and talk to them or they can be approached and not just sort of say, well, there's nothing we can do about it. Think about, is there some option? If there is some option. Can we make that work? Because oftentimes the very small adjustments that we need to make, you know, there's nothing that's going to require you to tear down the courthouse and rebuild it in a different way. It could be very simple things, you know, allowing somebody some minor accommodation that may be as simple as, and I think we talked about one instance, a stress ball. You know, if they want to have a stress ball while they're testifying, why should that make any difference? It doesn't, uh, but it makes them feel more comfortable. It makes them be able to get through that process better. It makes them be able to, their story, as you say, clearer. Um, I think that's all important for that part of that process. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I don't have any further questions. I'm good. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, nice to talk to you again. We had a nice conversation a couple of times, I think. Uh, we met in person. And I appreciate that very much. You have an outstanding uh, reputation, despite Judge Galvin. Uh, <laughs> hey, he's taking a hit today. Uh, Ask Judge Galvin to leave. Galvin's been a big advocate, uh, as well as uh, Counselor Kennedy. Uh, Marty Healy grabbed me at the MBA Awards dinner and talked to me about you. Matt McDonough called me yesterday. Brian Merrick reached out to me. Uh, so many people. Um, and not, no one negative, no negative things. I know my, my colleague over here asked you about maybe not enough restraining orders issuing. And I have the opposite concern. I was a cop for 30 years, and I do appreciate your service very much as a DA. Um, and I was in court yesterday where my guy got hemmed up with a restraining order, an extension that should have never, ever, ever issued. And the judge extended it for another year. Because she said that's 20 years ago, something happened. Nothing's happened since. No altercation, no argument, nothing. He was a good dad who took his daughter's cell phone away. They weren't living together. And a uh, kid went home and said, Mom, my dad took my cell phone away. And she went to court and said, Hey, I'm afraid of him. 20 years ago, something happened. And literally, based on that, he got the restraining order. And then yesterday, we went to court and I thought, Geez, for sure, nothing's happened in the last year. Nothing, no violations. The share in custody of the kid. He's actually had full custody of the kid for two years, 14 years old. He sees that she's doing bad things on her cell phone. He grabs her cell phone. The judge yesterday extends the order again for another year, takes his guns. You know what he does for a living? He does security. He represents a, a company that they, uh, they protect celebrities and things like that. He can't work for two years. We're doing contract and stuff and other things. But I'm telling you, um, I've seen it over and over again where I think judges go the other way and they're overprotective. I mean, nothing's happened in 20 years. The guy's had guns for 20 years. Um, what's your experience? I think it's, I mean, I think that I have had, as I said, I, I've represented folks on both sides, but so I've represented people that are defending themselves with the restraining orders and also plaintiffs uh, who are coming. I think that they're some of the harder things that judges have to balance. Um, and, you know, I think we all have had, I've had experiences just like that. Um, I know. 
attorney for sure. and, uh, and I spoke about one recently similar experience uh, where they, you know, the evidence just didn't really match up with what was being um, claimed. And, you know, I've practiced in family law as well. And I've seen instances where, you know, um, they are being used to gain some advantage in the process. And those are all, and I think what's unfortunate about that is that they diminish. There are a lot of people that need them. I've also worked with a lot of people that need them and they need them bad. And it's the only thing that keeps them safe. It keeps them safe physically, but also gives them a sense of feeling safe about their daily lives. And so I think for in those instances that you're talking about, which I have to acknowledge because I've worked with those types of cases before too. In those cases, I think what's most troubling to me about that is in instances where they're being misused is that they really diminish the value and they diminish, um, you know, they diminish the the use of folks that really need them and who are using them properly or who are asking for them under circumstances that they really need them. So. I think that though it's an, you're touching on an area that is very difficult to balance for any judge. And I think the most important thing the judge can do is to and hopefully this happened in your case, but in my experience, the most important thing that they can do for us is to give us as much time as we need to flesh out all the different issues. And um, the time that I've really felt the worst about those cases or cases like what you're talking about are ones where there's been a very quick judgment about it's been applied for and I'm going to issue it. Or there's been, you know, a very quick judgment about it's both, it happens both ways. I think that anytime there's not a lot of discussion about it or people aren't permitted to bring in their witnesses or to whatever, whatever it is they're going to do, that really diminishes the judge's ability to make a good or the best decision they can. And I don't know that any judge. Uh, if they were testifying under oath, would tell you that they've made the right decision in every single one of those cases, because uh, it's very difficult to do. Yeah, it was, it was just very frustrating. I mean, at the end of it all, my client said, "You know, geez, judge, this is not justice." I mean, a couple, like, what did I tell me what I did wrong? You know, um, and uh, and he'll go to the appeals court. It's going to cost him a ton of money, um, and I'm pretty sure it will get flipped. But it shouldn't come down to that. Um, you know, and we brought out that she's in public housing. She needed the kid to live with her. She was going to get thrown out. It was just a total miscarriage of justice, and I'm very disappointed. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope you're not going to be that judge. <laughs> I, I hope so, too. <laughs> Perfect pause. Other than that, all right, I'm done blowing off Steve from yesterday. Um, <laughs> back my Still in his questions. Yeah, yeah. but uh, other than that, um, like I said earlier, um, I think you're, um, you've done a whole lot in 20, just over 20 years. Uh, highly respected. You've done a great job on both sides of the aisle. Um, you have great, great advocates, and I'm going to vote for you next week. So thank you. Do you have another question? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I got a call from uh, Father Baspus, and he was a leader of the Greek Archdiocese who has asked us to vote for this outstanding nominee. The other thing is, with your permission, I'd just like to say um, I agree with Councilor Ferrara about uh, restraining orders 20 years, but I, I, it's very sensitive to me because that's why I ran, because um, I had a friend who was seeking a restraining order, and she had gone the eighth time to court. And um, so this time we had a friend of who was to go with her because um, he was getting more abuse of her, he was getting more abuse of her, and she feared. And so uh, the police officer went before the judge and said she fears for her life, give her, give him a $400,000 bail. So I gave him $400 bail, turned to my friend, my friend in fear, paid it. My friend was dead. And you know what that, Judge said to her, he said, you have been wasting my time and you've been wasting the court's time. And that's why it's very important. And, in, 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 as, you know, as my colleague said, about restraining orders, and they have to know that they are real and, and, and to act on them. And, um, you know, when our police officer friend said, she's fearing for her life, and then he said that, you know, and I didn't know. I didn't know God was possible. I didn't know how, how the judges got their jobs, I'll tell you. My husband was a, I was a firefighter. Our friends were police officers, firefighters. I didn't know. And when I found out, 
I said, there'll never be a judge like that if I get elected. So I looked at the duties of the governor's council. I said, I can do that. And that's how I did it. So that's why it's very important to me when I'm here bringing up 209 A's, they are important and they have to be. I worried, Councilor Duff, I weighed, I really worried through the pandemic because I thought some of the courts were on the phone. How can you see someone's body language when they've been accused? But Councilor, do you have anything to say? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going on and yeah, I just want to mention Father Basper. So that's okay. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> that was interesting. Um, thank you for your application. We've spoken several times and we've covered all the issues today. Um, it will be my pleasure to put your name into nomination when we meet again with the Lieutenant Governor. That said, this hearing is closed. Uh, Madam Chairwoman.